So the first question, oh, thank you for recording. Some people are gonna ask for that. Who just did that? Did you do that, Travis? You can take the rest of the night off. That was a good move. All right, so one of the assumptions we want to address is does the Bible work? Does it work for individual transformation? Does it also work for societal transformation? We're gonna answer those questions. Very easy answer for the first one is individual transformation. How many followers did Jesus start with? 12. Okay. How many, how many Christians are on the earth today? Hmm. More than 12. More than 12, yes. There are 2.2 billion, according to the Pew Research. Some might say 2.3. We're not gonna fuss about the detail, but point being, we went from 12 to 2.2 billion. That becomes self-evident that their God works in individual lives. But, so the citations, I wanna be a good steward of information. And we can see that the gospels provide those citations along with a few research. But what about societal transformation? What proof of concept do we have that the Bible actually works with societal transformation? Well, I'm gonna look at a new piece of study that just came out that everyone's gonna like. There's a new study that was spanning from August of 2012 to August of last year. The summary was just put forth recently. It included 50 major US companies. Now, we're used to seeing some information on Chick-fil-A, and that's wonderful. They're knocking it out of the park. But this involved a multitude of companies, 50 of them, major companies, and it spanned across 10 years. These 50 companies, had Christian faith practices integrated into their operations. What was the result? The returns to their owners for those 50 companies were 78% higher than the companies who did not have Christian practices integrated into their operations. Now, once people start seeing this, and that they start feeling more confident, I believe it isn't gonna take much, and that's gonna be 100% return, a double what the non-faith integrated companies experience. When this comes, when I get full permission to use, I will share this, so stay tuned. This is really good stuff. It's quantifiable proof of concept that the Bible works in society. So here's what I believe. I believe God is asking tonight, where are the 50 cities in the United States that demonstrate the, God, the kingdom of God? Where are they? Where are they? We've got 50 companies. Where are the 50 cities? And this is where you step into the making of history. This is why you're here tonight, because this is what God has, I believe, next. I believe that God is extending an invitation to every person on this Zoom call tonight. How do I, why do I feel that way? When we gathered together in Denver a couple of weeks ago at Father Phil's church, I believe God provided the men in that church a word. And that comes from scripture in Luke 9. And the first four words of verse 1 is, then he called his. Now, some people would say, well, that's kind of boring. But now... He calls his. Today, he is calling his for city transformation, for apostolic teams, 
And again, this is where you step in to making history. Steady transformation goal. When you talk to Adrian and myself and Travis, we want to see cities on a hill all over this nation. And I'll include Dr. Greg Pog on that as well. And I believe that as we end this night, many of you are going to want to see city transformation. What does that mean? Well, for one city that John Brennan might be in, he would probably say, I want that to be a cancer-free city. For someone else that's got a history of law enforcement, they might say, I'm called to help a, find a crime-free city. But others that have been involved in poverty and hunger, they may say, God's calling me to a city that's going to be hunger-free. God has the ability to do any of those and all of those. That would be exciting to see that start to happen across this nation, that we would have cities on a hill in every state and hopefully multiple cities on a hill in every state. So we need solutions. Secular solutions are not working. Would anyone agree with that? Mm. Yes. All right. So if the secular solutions are not working, we need kingdom solutions. And guess where the answer is? In the Bible. So let's take a look. According to Bible scholar, Dr. Jill E. Marshall, a lot smarter than I am, I've never had any formal training in the Bible. So that doesn't, hopefully that doesn't completely scare you away. Um, but Travis is still here, so don't leave. He's a good guy. Uh, you can count on him. But according to, don't believe what I say, Dr. Jill E. Marshall, who is a Bible scholar, says that of the 61 cities that are listed in the book of Acts, there are 32 cities that were most impacted. So the question is, by who? Who were they most impacted by? So we're going to get into some quantifiable evidence, proof of concept, for societal city transformation. The answer is who? The apostles. But wait a minute. When I was looking at this research, God said, I believe, dig deeper. Who specifically were the catalysts for that transformation? And the specific answer is apostolic teams. 30 of the 32 cities that experienced a move of God in the book of Acts included, involved an apostolic team. The only two that didn't were those that were impacted by an individual called Philip, Philip the Evangelist, in Gaza and Azores, those cities. But guess what? Philip was on his way to hosting the Apostle Paul in his house along with his four prophetic daughters. So he was on his way, even though he was an individual at that moment, he was on his way to becoming part of an apostolic team. So all 32 cities impacted in the book of Acts included people that were currently involved in an apostolic team or were on their way to becoming involved in an apostolic team. So what's the short definition of an apostolic team? A small team of people called, equipped, and sent by God. And we'll expand on that in just a little bit. This information comes from the book, Isaiah 9-7, and the information there is in front of you. All right. So show me how to transfer Denver. Anybody know where this picture was taken? Go ahead and unmute if you know the answer and shout it out to us. 
Father Phil's church. Father Phil's church. Isn't that amazing that you can stand at his altar and look out over the city of Denver? And this is a picture of that. So what, is it, what does Denver have to do with the Bible? A lot. The first time Jesus sent out his apostolic team can be summarized into 12 words, and we're going to get to those in a second. But let's look a little bit closer at Luke 9, verses 1 through 2. So this would be a time to pull out your Bible if you've got one handy, because we're going to reference those two verses, and then we're going to wrap up. This isn't going to take long. And then we'll be able to open up for questions. All righty? But this is the meat. We're going to switch to the spiritual, biblical stuff, the meat of this. And this is going to go fast. It's going to be fairly simple. So let's go ahead and look at Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. Are you ready? Here we go. Then he called his. Remember that? Here we go. Then he called his 12 disciples together, gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Okay? So is there a proof of concept before we go any further? And guess what? We might glaze over Luke 9, verse 6, but it says, So they departed, went through the towns, and doing what? Exactly what Jesus had in mind. Preach the gospel and healing everywhere. So this is the recording of the first proof of concept for apostolic transformation. Jesus not only said it, but verse 9 confirms that it actually happened. It's our first proof of concept as recorded with an apostolic team. All right, are you ready to keep going? It gets better. So when we look at Denver, we look at Las Vegas, we look at Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We look at St. Paul, Minnesota. We look at Iowa City. Whatever city you happen to be in, city transformation can be summed up into 12 words. 12 words. Are you ready for the 12 words? I need an amen before I go further. I just do. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Steve. We're on the same page. Here they are. All 12 of them at once. Go ahead and write these down or take a picture of your screen with your iPhone or your smartphone. Number one, call, call to his team. Number two, equipped with his authority. Number three, sent with his plan. Now, there are three mistakes that can be made with these 12 words. If you simply remove the word his and replace it with my, M-Y, then you will have three mistakes in your transformation process for a city. So before we move any further, let's double check and make sure that we're sure that these 12 words apply to transformation. And here it is. Then he called, they were equipped with authority, and he sent them out. So called, equipped, and sent. Mary Musk is on this call right now from Oregon. I didn't mention city transformation in Bend, Oregon. She already knows this stuff because guess what? She taught it to me. So this would be a good time to give a shout out to Mary. So thank you, Mary. All right. So pretty simple, right? 
So let's dig in a little bit further. But what about city transformation in one day? God can do above and beyond, right? So let's look at the story of the 5,000. And that's going to come a little later on in Luke 9. So as you're, as you're finding that spot in Luke 9, I'm going to take another drink of water. So I'm going to summarize this in my own words. The, the apostles come to Jesus and they say, hey, we've got this great idea. We've got a plan to transform the multitude that's in front of us. We've got at least 5,000. So here's the deal, Jesus. We're going to send them away to the area and to the, and to the neighboring towns and cities. And we're going to encourage them to find something to eat. So follow our plan, Jesus. We've got a secular plan for a secular problem. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And they go, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, let us help you, Jesus. I think you got the wrong plan. Our plan is more logical. See, because there's only two fish and five loaves. So if you'll agree with us, then we can send these people away. And what was Jesus' response? He basically blew them off and ignored them. He said, have them sit down in groups of 50. So let's take a look at that. We've got this story happening in Luke chapter 9. Verses 12, 13, and 14. And in 15, they finally agree. After arguing their case, they agree to going away from the secular solution to a kingdom solution. And in verse 15, it says, and they did so and made them all sit down. So here we are, they have the right team, they have the right authority from God, and they're still wanting to do their plan. And it isn't until verse 15 that they agree with God's plan. So, Paul to his team, sent with his authority, I'm sorry, equipped with his authority, sent with his plan. All right. So here are the two questions that will get you started in Bend, Oregon, and St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah, and you're saying, yeah, we get it, we get it, we get it. Uh, Las Vegas. No, okay, I'll stop. Here are the two questions to get you started. Are you ready? Question number one, who is your 12? Who is your 12? And question number two, who is your multitude? Who is your multitude? The authority and the plan will come later. For now, those are the questions that need to be asked at the beginning of an apostolic team. Now, I want to talk a little bit about each of those, and then we'll wind this up. Your 12 is not a literal 12. That's metaphoric. It stands for a perfect government. Jesus started with four. So you can start with three, four, seven, whatever number that God wants. The most important thing I can share with you about an apostolic team is this. This is not your team. This is God's team. He has assigned you to pick your team based upon his team. 
So what you see the Holy Spirit doing, that is what you need to do. You should not go to the four guys or the three guys that are on your bowling team. You should not go to the guys down at the lodge or the women at the auxiliary or at the library. This may not even be your small group at church. It might include some of them, but it needs to be the team that God has assigned for this situation. Why? Because they're going to have the things that you need when you start executing the plan. You don't know what the plan is yet. God knows what the plan is. So you have to rely on his choice of who he has for this assignment. So the most important thing you can do is choose his team, whatever number that is, three, four, 12, doesn't matter, it's his team. And then the second question, that can come after your 12 metaphorically come together. And that is who is the multitude? That might be the education system in Las Vegas. That might be the, the drug situation in Denver. That might be poverty in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. That may be a corrupt government in St. Paul. It can be any area of that city that needs to be transformed. So those are the two questions. Who is your multitude? And who is your 12 with starting with who is your 12? So your assignment is that we're going to gather together again in Denver in approximately two months. Here is your assignment. Between now and that two months, start asking God, who is your 12? Who is your team that God has assigned for you to steward or to be on a team with? You don't necessarily have to lead it, but there's a good chance you might, or at least facilitate. So in the next two months, ask the Holy Spirit, who is your team? And then you can invite those people to that event that Travis and I will host in Denver. And Steve, if you want to do one in St. Paul, we'll figure out a way to do one in St. Paul. Greg will be all over that. So that's the assignment. Who is your 12, metaphorically? And you've got two months to lean into the Holy Spirit and then you can invite your entire team to this event that Travis and I will put together. We haven't decided. We want to get your input. What are the right dates to have that? Do you want it in late April, beginning of May? I know it's going to work best for Greg on April 28th and 29th. But we also want to make sure that people are going to be able to attend. And especially Travis's apostolic team that are laying the foundation for other apostolic teams. I believe that Travis wants to have at least 12 apostolic teams in Denver so we can have a mass surge to transform the city. So that's it. That's the wrap up. We've got 10 minutes to go before we're done. I'm going to stop sharing unless somebody wants to see a specific slide again. If you do, um, go ahead and unmute. Let me know what slide you want to see. I'll go back to it. If not, then I'll stop sharing. And then Travis and I can answer questions for anybody that has them. So is there anybody that wants a slide before I unshare? All right, I'm going to stop sharing. We'll go back. And we yeah. had Gary's iPhone as 
has jumped on. We've had Todd join us. That's awesome. And um, Brad, I don't know if you were on before or not, but welcome to the three of you. Um, Thank you. Yes. Todd, you are a man of God. So glad to have you here. Travis, you want to introduce anybody else? Brad is here. Gary Borgendale is here from Minnesota. And I believe Dean has maybe joined. I can't remember. Do you, Travis? Dean, yeah, Dean just signed on from uh, Winter Park. Awesome. So cool. Um, well, I, I know this is kind of the starting point of one saying, God, am I called to either be part of an apostolic team or to start one? And that's, I think, an important part of this is, am I, am I called to, and what does that look like? What, what industry? Is it a region? Is it an industry? Is it an initiative? Uh, and I think it's become kind of clear. I, I can say from my own experience in this, I've been um, first exposed to this. When was your conference in Minnesota? Do you remember the date? Greg, it was November 11th. And then we had a Saturday morning on November 12th. Is that right, Greg? Yes. So I, I flew out not knowing any of these guys, not knowing what to expect or why I'm going to Minnesota. I'm going off of a prophetic word that I believe was from the Lord and that I was supposed to go. And I call up Adrian and I'm on a plane to Cedar Rapids and we drive up to Minneapolis. And we did everything and, we could to keep people from outside Minnesota out of the room. I don't know what happened with the people at the front desk, but somehow three guys got in from Denver alone. Yeah. <laughs> so... When the Lord wants you in a room, there's nothing anybody can do to stop that. Amen. Um, right, right. And in my experience, so since then, um, we've been building a team here in Denver, specifically around the initiative. So some of you guys are familiar with the ARC Identity Training, some of you not yet. And the, the ARC Identity Training has become this initiative in the Denver area. But it's also happening in Las Vegas. So it's kind of like this interesting uh, kind of cross between region and initiative. Uh, so Ashley, Leah, and Nate, um, we've been, we had our first apostolic team meeting uh, last month. And we began to ask the Lord, um, when he looks at Las Vegas, what does he see? We began to ask uh, with Adrian, Adrian um, moved to Iowa uh, earlier last year or mid last year. And um, he's been on the ground there kind of um, just chipping away, making relationships and, and, and building. And we're, we're just launching kind of having these initial meetings and conversations and prayer time, uh, just listening to the Lord about what he wants to do in Cedar Rapids and Iowa city. Um, so this can be, as big as God wants it, it can be focused on a city or a town. It can be focused on a state. Um, and as you guys can see, even on a, a bigger scale, uh, Steve, you're on several different apostolic teams. And really the one for Isaiah 9-7 is a national team. Is that correct? Correct. And Mary is on that. Uh, so we've got people from Ohio, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Oregon. Yes, cross nation. Awesome. So, so you guys can see this can be on different scales, and it's not one size fits all. It's not a um, cookie cutter situation. It's really what the Lord wants. Amen. Um, so, if you guys don't know Bob Adrian, some of you do. Uh, Bob Adrian, could you wave to us? Um, so Bob was one of the one of the early guys of Rama. Um, here in Colorado, and out of that has started uh, these house churches, and now Bob is feeling called. Is it okay to talk about this, Bob? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, why don't you stay unmuted for just a second? Bob is feeling called now to bring um, house churches 
to just people that have been watching what they've been doing from around the country. And I think you're, you're going to be taking a trip up Calif up to California and Washington. Um, is that correct? Seattle, Santa Rosa, and uh, the Reading area, Shasta, Mount Reading? Shasta. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's already these house churches planted um, in Colorado, in the Denver area. And what would it look like um, for Bob to have this apostolic team that now begins to take these house churches to different places and really... I think a lot of us may function in this in this way. We, you know, sometimes we have operational leadership. I think one of the biggest things that I've learned from Steve, it was kind of an aha moment that I had with him, uh, where there's a difference between operational teams and spiritual authority teams. Mm -hmm. They can overlap, right? Right, Steve? Correct. Right. They can overlap, but in many cases, they don't. Where, for example, with our ministry with the ARC, uh, the guys who are on our authoritative team for Denver, right? They, they're not necessarily involved in the in the day-to-day -day with, with the ministry. But they are pressing in and hearing God and 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 fighting for what they know. God wants to do here in this city. Amen. So I wow. hope you guys are excited to, to see what God can do. If you, if you really let him lead you, it's our job to yield. Go ahead, Steve. So Bob, uh, I just want to say to you that when I was in Denver a couple of weeks ago, God woke me up in the middle of the night and said, remember the house churches, hmm. remember the house churches. So, um, I'd like to visit with you sometime about that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, uh, the verse that God is giving me right now to share with you is Isaiah 2.2. 2, because a lot, there's a lot of focus on the seven mountains right now. Um, but there's also what Isaiah 2.2 2 talks about. And that is that in the latter days, the Lord will establish his mountain above the mountains. So Travis would say, where are we going with this? We're establishing the mountain above the mountains, in my opinion, as it talks about in Isaiah 2.2. 2. So Mike Fish, I'm going to move now to him. He is from Rochester. He's been on an apostolic team for three to four years. And... His, as an example, Travis and everyone, Travis talked about maybe it's an industry. And Mike has been in the baking industry for a century. His family has been in the baking industry for a century, a hundred years for those like me that can't count. <laughs> That's a long time. And God spoke to him and said, okay, now I'm starting, you have authority in the baking industry, spiritual authority, what Travis was talking about, and now I'm going to send you out to use that authority to transform the baking industry. So what did he do? What did God have him do? He actually threw away all the recipes for 100 years and started over with recipes that the Holy Spirit is giving him to start transforming the industry and aligning the industry with God's design and destiny for bread. And he named the new company Bread of Life Bakery. Mike, is that a fair summary of what's going on in your life? And make sure you introduce whoever you have in your lap. <laughs> yeah, Lucas and Gideon. Oh, oh you got two of them. He's got kids all over the place oh. there. It's just like the Musk family over there. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, you got it, Steve. I found some more recipes and I just threw them out last week. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So thank you, Travis, for letting me jump in. Yeah, this is um, 
Good stuff. I, I think you guys can see that we're really just scratching the surface here. And Steve wants to really mm -hmm. kind of stir up what does this look like for you? Um, and a lot of you are already in ministry. A lot of you are already serving in different ways. And this is kind of like, let's, let's get intentional with what God really wants in this season. And go ahead, Greg. Yeah, Steve, um, as we pray about forming apostolic teams, what would you say are some qualities that one would be looking for, for people on an apostolic team? Hmm. Well, some people would like to say that the fivefold would be a, a good thing to have. And I agree that the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, but honestly, I think the best answer is whoever God chooses. Mm. Because if you're on a team with someone that maybe got there and wasn't part of who God had in mind, they can be very distractive. Um, I was on a team where the husband wasn't in agreement with the wife. And the husband invited some people on the team and they weren't in unity on it. And the husband was feeling sorry for this couple and just invited them to be on the team. And eventually the team pretty much imploded and went away. Eventually that team will come back again uh, in its right team. But uh, I would say to your question, Greg, whoever God is putting in front of you, and it may be people that you're just meeting for the first time. So really start taking note of that and it may be that after you get involved you'll find out that god is now calling that person to be a teacher or an evangelist or a prophet um or an apostle but at least so far we don't call each other apostles we're just doing the work of the apostle we're trying to keep a below the radar humble approach to this authority mm -hmm. Is there anything you want to add, Greg? No, I, I agree with what you've said. I, I would say that from my perspective, you're looking for people who you discern are being called by God uh, to look beyond their own local ministry, their own local business, people who have a wider vision, a kingdom vision, people who are looking to transform uh, a sphere of society, transform a city, transform a state. And, uh, and so that's who I would, that's who I would look for to be on an apostolic team. I don't want to talk somebody, I don't want to talk somebody into that. I want to discern who's caught that vision already. Could I, 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 I jump in here? Go ahead. Gary, Gary jump in. Hang on just a second, Gary. I think Bob was ready to start saying something a minute ago. Well, I, I just had a question on um, whether or not a person would most likely be a team member or a team leader. How would you, how would you pursue that answer to that? You can still coordinate and invite people and say, I don't feel that I'm being called to be the leader right now. Um, so let's just kind of play that out and let the Holy Spirit guide us. And maybe God will then prompt someone in the team to be the leader, or he might all of a sudden call you to be the leader when you're three months into it. So just kind of let it play out and, and follow the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Bob? It does. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Gary. Well, one of the things, just to follow up on with what Greg was talking about, some of the times I speak into people that have these abilities that they don't even know, yet they have a cause that is very deep. And it's like, maybe you should invite the Lord into this as well. So part of what you do in these apostolic teams is look for situations where people have a passion in a certain area and have you ever thought about what God might do with an apostolic team or releasing the apostolic team? They may look at you like deer in headlights, 
but it's that opportunity to explain what this is and for them to pray about this opportunity to be part of an apostolic team. So what I'm saying is there's a certain degree of education that might be needed to uh, allow people to understand that God is calling them into this role. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Bob. So Travis, do you want to have another one of these Zoom calls in a month just to keep the momentum going? And then we can try to finalize our details for the two month live in in-person event. How do you want to move forward? I definitely think we should have another Zoom. Um, I can put something on the calendar uh, for an evening, uh, kind of a, a midway point to an actual intensive training uh, that we'll do live in Denver. Um, Mary, did you have something? Something real quick. Um, when C was talking about Isaiah 2-2, um, it talks about the mountain of the Lord being over all the other hills. And I thought that was amazing, you know, that the mountain is so big that the other mountains have now become hills. The other part of that is we're not just trying to ascend to the seven mountains and rule and reign kind of like a dominionism thing. What we're doing is we're coming up to Christ, to Jesus, to rule and reign with him. Mm -hmm. And that influences all the seven mountains. All the mountains are attached at the base. Otherwise, they're a butte because a butte stands alone. A mountain range is all attached to the base. So um, when, when feeling out these potential team members, that's a part of it too, is we're not just trying to change a mountain so that we have God at the head of everything. It's what is God's purpose and plan? It could be lower down the mountain, in the middle, at the top. We don't know. We find out together. Amen. Good. Good point. Hey, Steve, I was thinking about, this is Mark. I was thinking about what you said about the fivefold. You know, it occurred to me that, yeah, God can, he can call the gifted or he can also gift the called. Either right. way, spirit can do whatever it wants in that situation. Yes. Good cool. Point. Yeah. Amen. So let's pray out and we will get another Zoom uh, on the schedule. Dean, you have something? Yeah, yeah I, I do. Sorry, I got on late. I forgot about it. And my friend Steve Van Zickel there in Minneapolis. Precious <clears throat> brother, I'm choking up. <laughs> we were friends back in open church days. He's an amazing man of God. But anyhow, good to see you, Steve. But um, recently I found a material uh, that Sid Roth is offering a book and um, and something that I hope people check out. I don't know if you've seen this one or can see it, but it's called Turnaround Decrees by John Hamill. It's um, finding it to be very rich in how to pray. He lives in Washington, D.C., and he's, he's been doing this for years, learning how to to make decrees that um, turn things around. So I think this will be an essential part of our equipping at some point, but I just want to mention that. Good stuff. Thanks, Dean. All yeah, right. I got a quick, quick point too. Um, sorry, I was late too. I almost forgot too until my kids reminded me. I'm like, oh my goodness, <laughs> get on that, get on that call. Anyways, um, uh, just to emphasize again, even though we've we've mentioned this, but it's so easy to uh, for our mindsets to go into, you know, take the take the bull by the horns mindset and jump into the flesh as opposed to being led by the spirit. It's such a fine line, so easy to go into our default and what we're used to doing. So I really encourage people to to stay as much focused on that as you can as it relates to the teams and forming the teams. Uh, but I would also say too is, is, uh, is pay attention, what I like to call looking at the data points. Uh, look at what God has done to orchestrate relationships and things 
uh, that he's been forming that you very well may have just completely forgot about or seen what he's doing. You can see patterns in how God moves and the things he's doing and the people he's putting together. And we may quickly, easily ignore certain people that he may have put in your path. Um, so pay attention to those things because it, it could be more of an indicator than you think as you know, to the teams and what, what God may be wanting to do. So, Really good insight, Todd. And Travis, if I can just mention that people would say, well, why don't we just do this in-person thing two months from now on Zoom again? Why do we have to get in person? One of the things that I'll mention is we're going to bring along a bunch of videos that Mary and I have worked on that are going to provide real testimony to every aspect of building that apostolic team. So you'll be able to see real people that have had real experiences that have uh, can pr provide proof of concept as well as just the, the testimonial aspect of it. Plus, as Travis would probably say, the ARC identity is very relational. And so getting in the same room is such a huge piece of that. It's just something special about that. So thanks, Travis. I'll be quiet now. I think we're... Oh, not another qu a question for me, actually. Maybe you guys covered this when I was uh, absent. <laughs> but uh, um, what is it? What would the team look like? So you have this apostolic team and you, you talked of leaders, but how would the team function? What would it look like uh, as they go out and, and move on the call that the Lord has put on their hearts? That's going to be different with every team. I've got a team that's a national team. I don't conduct those meetings. I just sit in on them. We've got a lady from Iowa that's very um, capable of, of leading the teams. Uh, for the Rochester, Minnesota apostolic team uh, that Mike was on, um, what we did is that we would have a two hour meeting uh, once a month. Uh, no, it was a half a day meeting once a month. And the first half of the meeting, somebody, we would all rotate, whoever would, the leader would rotate. But then I would always finish with where the apostolic team is going. So more of a visionary end to it. So it can it can take up any type of, of makeup that you want. Gary leads an apostolic team for the state of Minnesota. He's on his iPhone. He leads an apostolic, a state apostolic team. And uh, they meet every week on a Zoom call. And they've been meeting uh, for two years on Zoom every single week. I don't know that they've even maybe missed one week. Uh, Mike's team, they met once a month in person for a half a day. It's what uh, Travis's team, uh, I'm not sure what your makeup is, Travis, but it's there is no boundaries, there is no pattern. Um, this is just so Holy Spirit saturated, it's just too fun. So sorry for not a more, uh, more specific answer, Todd, but it's just really Holy Spirit driven. It's really cool. Well, and of course, where my mindset goes, you know, when you look at scripture, you know, they're all sent out two by two. Yeah. And yes. so is is it, would it be two members on the team that, that are assigned to, and as it relates to ARC identity, to, to lead a training, to go through the, you know, ARC identity 101 and 102? Uh, is it that type of thing? That's kind of what I'm thinking. Obviously, it's wherever the Holy Spirit's leading, but obviously an, a, an apostle is going out and tread new ground. You know, he's tilling the soil. And um, <clears throat> so what are the the team members doing to, to till the soil and is the purpose to come back and to meet and to share what's been going on, I guess? I think uh, I would look at John 13, 34. Oh, sorry, Adrian. Um, I'll finish. 13, John 13, 34 um, is where Jesus gives a new commandment to his 12. So this is uh, God's government to his governmental leaders. And he said, love one another as I have loved you. So that's really the first course of action is to come in love and unity with each other and with Jesus. 
And you just start doing that over the course of time and that gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And as that gets stronger, then God will start to say, okay, now I can release my spiritual authority for the bread industry with these people. And yes, there may be a couple people that will break off and focus on one aspect and then a couple people will break off and work on another aspect. And that might happen after a year or after two years, all of the above, Todd. So uh, let me see. My, okay, I'm on you. So Todd, I would picture it as, say, a football team, right? They all have the same vision or similar vision, same goal. They want to score, so they come together as a team. And on that team, they have different positions that where if they work together as a team, they get to accomplish something, right? Like score a goal, win the team, bring it to completion and so forth. So um, I would envision it more as a sports team of coming together, similar vision to conquer a similar goal. And within whatever that vision may be, whether it's to feed the hungry, to reduce the crime in the city or whatever, it may be that you guys have similar visions. So I, I believe it's a lot easier than we may think it is, you know, but you'll find these people as you start talking to people uh, about something, uh, they might reveal something in their life that might trigger something like, oh, that goes along with my vision. That goes along with the vision God has given me. And then next you know, you start expounding on that. So God will bring those people in your life. So the more you kind of press in and pray on what God really reveals to you, you're going to have these conversations with people that are going to trigger certain words that's going to spark interest in the vision God has for you. And so forth. So um, I, I would just be more, be aware when having conversations with people that you'll be surprised how quickly we'll bring this together. Well, it's, it's what I find interesting is I'm thinking about this more is when I think about Rama, I mean, that's what we've been doing 10 years. <laughs> you know, we've had what 400 guys come in in the last 10 years and, um, and created this community where, where similar visions are coming together. Uh, people that may have common visions end up doing certain things together and, and moving on. So I, I like, I like this whole thing. It's, um, I mean, and to me, it's like, we, we've already got the foundation set on creating the group. To me, it's, it's more like probably taking what, especially what Travis has uh, and, and putting a more formality to teaching identity and and doing heart transformation there but it's funny because I, I say that that we're already doing that because you know the holy spirit gives visions to people and it's not just one person it's multiple people and and he'll he'll end up bringing the people together that he's been given the vision to to accomplish his goal and they may be completing a certain task related to that vision and they have no idea another person is is working on a different task, but it's all related to the same vision. Then God brings them together. It's like, holy cow, you already did that? I've been looking for a guy that's completed that. And, and then you just come together and we see that all the time. So this is really cool. I mean, technically God is just coming in, I think you're saying, and, and bringing affirmation to, to what things he's already been doing and confirming it. So thank you, Brother Steve, for what you guys are doing there. That's really awesome. I love it. And wow. Todd, as our uh, Minnesota team, which includes Gary, who's been on the call, and Steve, myself, and a pastor named Dave Heisinger, uh, as we've prayed and built our statewide team over the last couple of years, we felt a call to release the apostolic by building apostolic teams all over Minnesota. So we see it as our role to connect people, like you said, who might have a similar passion for education transformation or the business business realm or the governmental realm or the church itself and there are, i believe there are lots of people who have an apostolic calling out there 
uh, who are running alone. And like you say, need to find others who have a similar vision. And so we want to help bring together people with similar vision and help them form apostolic teams so that our team itself is not doing, not doing all the works, I mean, not by any means, but we're raising up and releasing the apostolic across the state of Minnesota. And uh, so that's, that's what the yeah. Lord's been putting on our heart. I like it. I love it. I want to go back, if I may, to Steve's comment on love. And I've been involved with a lot of different ministries and all too often we've been focused solely on the ministry and we forget about the individual person. And so I really wanted to encourage you to love one another wholly. And by that, it means understanding what's going on in their lives, who their spouse is, who their children are, who their grandchildren are, what's going on in their life. Because you want to build this as a body, but you, want it, you, you don't want to neglect needs that your members have as you go doing it so it's just an encouragement of how to love one another is getting to know each other in depth and be able to pray in needs that they have whether it's in their church in their family uh, or health or whatever the case may be so that we're truly loving into this relationship yeah i love that gary it's all about um starting in your own home first so in your team you need to start doing in your team what you want to see happen outside right. your team that's right prayer is certainly foundational to that you know when we pray and just follow the trail god will show us each step along the way We've spent a lot of time in our Minnesota apostolic team just praying and seeking the Lord together and not moving too quickly to what we would all normally think of as action steps. Tried not to get ahead of what the Spirit wants us to do. And it's been a great process of discerning that so that now we're at the point we really feel we are ready to move forward. But it's been a process of really coming into you know, strong, strong agreement uh, as a team over the last two years. Sounds like we've already made a connection on the, on the chat from uh, Brad L. Yeah. Just it's Christmas on B, cards. Go on BTL. And let me share a little prophetic word here. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends in Colorado, and I see where the state has moved in Colorado, very similar to what we have occurring in Minnesota. And it's like, okay, body of Christ, it's time to rise up, rise up in the strength of Jesus Christ to turn the state back into relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's the heart for Minnesota as well. So I just speak into all my friends in Colorado with that uh, prophetic word to carry forth in changing your state to be aligned with God. Mm -hmm. You know, Gary, I was, I was hoping your prophetic, your prophetic word for me would have been to move to Mexico. <laughs> hey, I tried to have a prophetic word to move to Colorado 20 years ago, and I was up in the mountains, and it's like, God, speak to me, speak to me. <laughs> Not, I'm in Minnesota. Yep. I love Minnesota. I love it. You know, Minnesota is the state with the smallest soft drinks. Oh, really? Yeah, mini sodas, you see. Many sodas, yeah. I've heard that one a few times. <laughs> now, the, the thing is, I'm trying to think of the Lord saying in a connection how this connects Colorado to Minnesota. But one thought I've been having lately is that there, God provided a way into his presence, and that was the tabernacle pattern, which Jesus came down and fulfilled, and we follow him through that way. That is the way into God. And when you lay that pattern on the United States, um, 
it's it fits the pattern and minnesota would be part of the uh the grain belt which would be the showbread the table of showbread colorado would be the um where the altar of incense is before the veil and rocky mountains is the veil so anyhow i don't know how that connects the two states but it mm. makes me think that there is a connection there uh, well maybe. steve did you share early on about the the waterways in minnesota and how that impacts did you share about that already steve oh uh, but let me just stop here because we're sorry gary we're a half hour over the hour that we had originally committed to so i'm going to yield to travis um to uh to decide how you want to manage whether you want to keep going or whether we want to just continue this conversation uh in a month yeah, I think um, you guys should know that you can go to Isaiah97.com if you want more information. Um, Steve and his team have put together a lot of really great information and videos, and he's got a, a, a textbook um, as well as some master classes on this um, that you guys can can uh, you can consume as you as you like. Uh, I, I feel like we should not. Um, give you guys too much. There has to be some hunger in you guys that as we dig into this and, and roll this out for you over the next couple of months, um, there's there's a there's so much information and so much experience that they've had um, at building their own teams that I feel like as we glean from them, um, you know, let it be over time and really process what was released today and and remember Steve's two questions. Who's your 12 and who's your multitude? Um, and uh, let's get something on the calendar for next month. I'm sure, you, you know, lots more questions. You can invite more people. Um, we can really kind of grow this, um, this audience of people that are, are saying, God, how do we, how do we transform society? You know, and how do we do that? Well, so um, let's pray out. And I will follow up with all of you. Um, if you have not already created a profile on the ARC identity, I encourage you to do that. It's uh, like our own social media platform that we host courses and all kinds of types of content. And that's uh, how we will uh, communicate some of these events that we'll be doing in Denver. So bless you guys. Uh, let's have um, uh, Pastor Greg, would you pray us, pray us out? Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Steve. Heavenly Father, we just uh, we just ask you to now uh, impress on our hearts what it is that you would have each of us take away from this time together tonight. Uh, was there a word, Lord, that was spoken that was specifically meant for each of us to chew on, to process, to apply? Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you are releasing the apostolic, and we believe that with without it, the other ministry offices will not be as effective as you want them to be. We need the five-fold ministry uh, working together uh, to see transformation come. And so we thank you for Steve's teaching. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the uh, hearts you've given us all to see our spheres of influence, uh, our localities, our regions, our states transformed. And we pray for the guiding and empowering presence of the Holy Spirit now to lead us forward. In yeah. Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, Steve, for sharing with us. I really look forward to the next time. Bless everybody that, that was able to attend. Uh, this is recorded, so I will have it available on the ARC as well. So bless you guys. Bye, bless you all. Good to be with you. Uh, bless you guys. Thank you, uh, brothers and sisters. God bless.